Hi, I'm Pastor Bo Sang from Faith Presbyterian Church, and I'm here with my wife, Melissa, to do a pre-sermon preview. The title of today's message is called The Tree of Life, and the Tree of Life is uh, in the book of Genesis, but actually, uh, in the service, we cited two passages from the book of Revelations. The Tree of Life brings a lot of clarity to what the Bible has to, do, has to say and the continuity uh, from the beginning to the end of it. And what I love about his message is how he points out that, you know, a lot of people are seeking after um, being able to live forever. And um, I mean, people are studying even today, you know, how to do that. And so um, that um, quest is just something very important to people. And what we know from the Bible is that God gives us the way, you know, for eternal life. Um, what I remember growing up as a kid is, the you know diagram we'd always draw from um, just Sunday school you know one cliff and then there's like a big dip and then um, another cliff and the only way you know the one side of the cliff was where we are and the other side was um, where God is and the only way to get to God is through um, the cross that you would draw in the middle and so that would kind of be like the bridge um, and so what I love about what Bill was saying about the tree of life is that was kind of the way, that's kind of what God planned, you know, they could eat from the tree of life and live forever, but Adam and Eve chose to not do so. And so God um, was gracious enough to give us um, Jesus Christ to um, give us that way back to him. And John fourteen six says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um... So yeah, I think this sermon is just a great reminder for us all that we can seek that eternal life with God. Yes, that's very good, Melissa. So we're not going to waste any more time here. We're going to go ahead and move into the message today. We all hope you enjoy this message, the Tree of Life. Today our message is called Tree of Life. As it relates to eternal life, it gives us a definite reality check. <laughs> Talking about reality checks, I find that children are a reality check for all those perfectionists and know-it-alls and goody two-shoes out there nothing brings us back down to earth than children i heard this story about a five-year-old boy named benny he was thinking about what it was that he wanted for christmas one day he went to his friend's house and while he was there he fell in love with the outdoors he even found out that his friends happened to be hunters. And so you can only imagine what he wanted for Christmas that year. Hey, Mom, I know what I want for Christmas, he said. His mother responded, great. What is it you want? So Benny says, well, Mom, I got to narrow down to two things. Either a bow and arrow or a shotgun. <laughs> His mother was absolutely blown away by what it was that he wanted and tried to think of a nice way to tell him no. And she said, well, that's great, Benny, but we're just not hunting people. Benny was upset. He says, I know, Mom. I plan on hunting animals. Eternal life has been a goal of mankind since its earliest days. I think of the ancient Mesopotamian tale of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh actually set about on a quest to find the tree of life, obtained a branch of it, but was robbed of its fruit by a sneaky little snake. I also think around this time of the year of the story of Dracula, a little bit darker and everything, but Dracula is a cursed immortal who's kept alive through the centuries uh, by drinking the blood of unsuspecting victims. Fast forward a little bit further, and I think of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And you might remember that movie, Indiana Jones on a quest to find the Holy Grail, which if you drink from it, will give you eternal life. Well, now in our real world today, uh, we have people that are still seeking after everlasting life. For instance, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, decided that he is not going to make plans about dying. Instead, he has invested $1 billion to cure death 
and aging. Founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, has also invested in a similar endeavor. He's invested lots of money in trying to uh, do some research on longevity and why cells age and ultimately why does death even occur to begin with. Many, if not most people, fear death. What happens when you die? This is a question that plagues lots of people. And as Christians, we say that you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Heaven, of course, being eternal paradise, where hell is a place of eternal punishment. Now, it is hard to understand that death was not built into creation. It was a consequence of disobeying God. Think about it. Genesis 2.9 says that in the middle of the garden, we're talking about the Garden of Eden here, were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is interesting because Adam and Eve actually knew where the tree of life was. It was in the middle of the garden where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was as well. They could have eaten the fruit of the tree of life and lived forever. Now, this reminds me of when I preached in Rising Sun and uh, while we were driving there, one day we saw that there was a couch in the middle of a lawn in front of a home, and it had a sign on it that said, free. And then the next week, we drove back up to church, and we happened to see the exact same couch with the exact same sign. This came up in discussion after the church service was over, and one of the people in our congregation happened to know the people that lived at that home. And so he said, I'll solve their problem for them. All they need to do is take that free sign off and put on a sign that says something like $5 and I guarantee that the couch will be gone overnight. Sure enough, he told them about this. They switched the signs out and of course the couch was gone before the night was over. It also reminds me of another scene of a, of a TV show of this man who had a trampoline he was trying to get rid of and so he puts the free sign on their front lawn and it doesn't do the job the trampoline stays there and he's trying to get rid of it and then his <laughs> mischievous son decides to help him out he says dad all you gotta do is put a bike lock on it so he puts a bike lock on it and he says okay now what do we do so his son says okay now turn around and count to three and when you turn back around it'll be gone and so it shows you what happens when he turns around and counts to three. A thief comes up with a pair of bolt cutters, cuts off the bike lock, and runs off with the trampoline. Eternal life was and is a free gift from God. Sometimes when a gift is free, people don't want to take it. They ask themselves, how good could it possibly be if it's free? With these two trees placed in the center of the Garden of Eden, God presented two ways to mankind, the way of life and the way of death. After mankind's fall from grace, not much is said about the tree of life. Then you get to Revelation chapter 22. In the opening of this chapter, we are given our first detailed description of the tree of life. Let me read to you verses 1 through 3. It says, He showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the city's main street, the tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. Now, there's so much about these verses that are absolutely mysterious to me. And it's all right to say that something is a mystery to you. Say you don't fully understand something the Bible says. Nonetheless, I think we also have to say, I believe what it says. And what I find remarkable about this passage is the incredible consistency that it brings from all the way at the beginning of the Bible until 
the end of the Bible. And as Bible-believing Christians, we have to understand it in terms of eternal life, in terms of the Christian perspective, the biblical perspective on the afterlife, namely the resurrection. Because as Christians, we don't, we don't believe in concepts like nirvana or reincarnation or oblivion or the idea that there's some kind of a spirit world after you die that everybody goes to. Once again, we believe in resurrection. Jesus demonstrated to us what resurrection is. It is a bodily resurrection. And we will not be disembodied spirits. God gives us new bodies. Jesus demonstrated to us what resurrection is. In Luke 24, verses 38 through 43, Jesus allowed his disciples to test him. He said, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. That is I that, uh, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. So Jesus proved to his disciples that he was not a ghost. He was not a resurrect he was not resurrected as a spirit. He came back in bodily form. And although this was subtle, he asked for food that he ate it in front of his disciples. He was an actual physical body. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 45, go more into the nature of this resurrected body. The Apostle Paul calls it a spiritual body. Let's read its description. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of the earthly ones. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another one of the stars. In fact, one star is differs from another star in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Once again, a lot of mystery inside of this passage. But we can piece a lot of it together through the scriptures, but it is so hard to wrap your head around what it is saying. What is clear is the requirements to obtain eternal glory are the same in Genesis as they are in Revelation. You must eat the fruit of the tree of life. Now, 2,000 years ago, Jesus fulfilled the law of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant law said that anyone who is hung from a tree is cursed. Later on in the New Testament, we see that Jesus hung from what they called a tree, which we call the cross. And the curse he bore was the sins of all of mankind. So he fulfilled this prophecy, this, this scripture, that a man who hangs from a tree is cursed. He took upon our sins and our curse. And he is the fruit that came down from that tree. Through his death and resurrection, we too will be granted access to God's eternal kingdom. We can enter freely into his grace. The fruit of the tree of life is available to us all. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's message. Again, my name is Bill Sang at Faith Presbyterian Church. I'd like to invite you to our worship services, which are 1030 in the morning on Sundays. I'd like to remind you to like, share, and subscribe. And thank you so much for joining us for today.